Hello, welcome to Science Streams, and I am extremely happy to have Tammy Jovaleni, hopefully I said that right, um, here with us, and hydrologist extraordinaire, mm -hmm. if I dare say so. Um, and I, I first, when, when you responded to my request for, for guests, I was like, oh, this, this is really cool. And then I started actually like looking more into what you do. And I was like, oh my gosh, this, I don't, I don't have just, so I have Wonder Woman coming on the show. I mean, <laughs> I mean, to, to, to see you like, like right now, and then to think of you as a field researcher, it's kind of like a juxtaposition. So, um, so maybe describe what it is that you do and and kind of what I'm talking about, about field research and how awesome that is. So Vinny's already on. He's like, what does she do? Okay. Vinny's one of my students, by the way. And of course, the Mississippi River and then various large river systems in, in Europe. And I use um, Iceland really as my baseline for like some of the best water quality in the world. And my, um, my, my idea is that I'm looking at, at the water and the quality of the water to um, communicate conservation efforts to the communities that use the water. And so um, I look at developed and undeveloped and developing countries and, and how they're using the water and the quality of the water and the relationship that they have to the, have to the water. And it didn't always start out as that. I was really just starting out to look at the quality of the water. And then I recognized the relationship that people have to the water is such an important part of the, of the puzzle and how we talk about conservation and how that conservation message is is used and utilized. Awesome. So since I know that like Vinny is here and he lives on a river, right? Right, city of Runsler's right on the Hudson River. So, uh, you know, maybe he can put in chat if he feels he has a relationship with the river at all. Yeah, and we'll wait for that. He can put that in chat. I know I do. So one of the things I used to do, which is pretty cool, is I was a, an educator on the replica ship Half Moon, which was a uh, replica of Henry Hudson's uh, ship. And as an educator, we had kids would come aboard and we would do river sampling and everything else on the Hudson River from uh, Rensselaer, you know, up where Albany is, all the way down to New York Harbor. And sometimes even out like Verrazano Narrows. So that was a, my big experience with connecting to the river in in a very you know intimate way, um, similar to what you, you do as far as research. So that's that's my connection. And one thing I do know about in Rensselaer, and it's still the case when striper season starts, you know, because all, all a lot of the kids will go out striper fishing with members of their family. Uh, it's just, I, it was something when I first moved into the school, I didn't realize it was a thing. And it's like, you know, you know, I just like, really? They're like, yeah, I'm missing part of school today because it's really good striper season right now. And it's like, okay, all right, <laughs> go connect with your river. I think that's an important thing. Uh, and uh, what did Vinny say here? Yeah, I go there every week, either go to Fort Cralo and sit on the wall and look into the river for... Uh, the view 
So I think this is similar to what uh, kind of the research that you're getting into, Tammy. Yes. Um, so I can give you an example. Um, so in Africa, the headwaters of the Nile River is in Jinja, and and people are terrified of the water. Like people, there's crocodiles, there's hippos. Most of the people don't want to swim, don't know how to swim. And so their connection to the water is only as um, a food source. And that food source is very important, but because of the pollution, the, the food source has become lesser and lesser. So their tie to that water body has become lesser and lesser over the past 10 or 20 decades. Um, Opposite of like the Ganges River, so the Ganges River flows through um, through India, east to west, and people revere the Ganges River. Like there's pilgrimage, and they even go as far as to call it the Mother Ganga because it's part of their Hindu religion, where they're um, where they see it almost as like a holy entity. And so the conservation message, if we're if we're trying to speak one about helping to conserve and purify the water, is very different when you're looking at a body of water that you're terrified versus one that is part of your, that is truly part of your culture. Um, and, and even in Iceland where the water quality is, is close to being perfect, as perfect as, as you can for a body of water, um, it, the, the people there just very much um, understand human connections to their environment. So they really understand that they need to protect that the water and they value the water, so they they don't take for granted that the water is coming off the glacier. Like they, it's, they all they know the source of where the water is coming from, and they appreciate that, and so they're willing to protect it in a different capacity. So it's been very interesting to see culturally um, the importance of water and um, what people um, see the water as beyond just being something that you use or ingest um, for your livelihood. Yeah, and Vinny says she should research planet 4546.b. I don't even know what that means, but maybe you should look into that. I will. <laughs> um, Thanks, Vinny. And, and so you've been to every continent at this point, except for Australia. And have you been to Antarctica? I've not. I've been to five different continents. Okay. So I've not been to Australia and I've not been to... Antarctica, and I was supposed to go to Australia before the pandemic came, so it's uh, it's awaiting me. <laughs> right, so I wanted to ask you about that as, you know, kind of a, a, a field researcher and what you do. This must be like snipping your wings, the, the whole pandemic. Oh. You know, I know some lab researchers where it's kind of like, oh, okay, yeah, I can just get my data from, you know, the Large Hadron Collider regardless, you know, <laughs> but as a field researcher, it's got to be a little bit different um, with uh, with the pandemic, especially as far as travel. So can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, um, you know, I'm a frequent flyer mile holder um, and I'm usually moving and shaking really every two months or so because I'm going to conferences if, if nothing else. And I always really for the past 10 years, I've been abroad every single summer. So it, um, it has dampened my spirits. And so what I've done instead is I've just kind of focused a little bit more on, um, on home. And so in Rome, Georgia, there's uh, three rivers that, two rivers that converge to form uh, a major river system. So I've done a little bit more homework in my backyard and I think that's good. And I've also done a little bit more research along the Mississippi River. So some of my, my, my initial water quality assessments were on the Mississippi, but that was more than a decade ago. And so I just kind of flipped my research plans and, um, and took a trip to the Mississippi and kind of highlighted that, revisited some sites and started to think about home base a little bit more. And, and, um, and I probably needed to do that, honestly, because um, I can certainly make more contributions than what I, what I have done to my local area regarding the river systems um, and even just analyzing the Mississippi. Um, my big heartbreak was though, I was, um, I'm granted uh, a research position on a barkentine sailing ship, so like a Pirates of the Caribbean three-mast sailing ship going to 10 degrees north latitude, and it was supposed to go last July. So it's been rescheduled for this July. Um, so I'm one of uh, 33 research scientists aboard this sailing ship, 
and we're going to the to 10 degrees north which is the Saval territory of international islands and i'll be looking at water quality on those islands but i'll, I'll also be looking at climate glaciers um so uh, water quality is 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 my my big forte but my other love is iceland and i just wrote a textbook about the geology of iceland that was published by wiley in july and it focuses on the tectonics, volcanics, and glacial features of Iceland. And so uh, my research position aboard the sailing ship will allow me to look at other um, northern latitude islands. And I'm hoping to make some comparisons between those and Iceland. Iceland's at 66 degrees north, and I'll be at 10 degrees north. So, um, so you're right, COVID has kind of like um, settled me down in the United States a, a little bit, but you know, there's, it gave me more time to write and reflect and focus on home base. Right. And Volcano Doc, you know, asks, you know, what do you think can be done to get Americans to realize the importance of water? And I think you being kind of stuck at home kind of helped you make that connection a little bit. Um, yeah, for sure. And, um, and I think, you know, I'm also, I'm a native Detroiter and um, I went to school at University of Michigan and Flint, Michigan is, is very much nearby. So for me, when the Flint water crisis um, became apparent, um, for me especially, but I hope for the rest of the United States, we got to see um, what value water does. And, and maybe that's something that we've taken a little bit for granted as a, as a natural resource in our country. Um, but um, it, it, you know, and that's the thing, like we call water a renewable resource, right? Because you've got the water cycle. Ultimately, like if, if the water in your rivers or the water in your groundwater is contaminated, it's not, re it's not renewable it's, or it's really hard to make it renewable because you've mm -hmm. got to strip away those contaminants. So I think, um, you, you know, I think that, um, that if nothing else, I'm hoping that that perspective of what happened in Flint kind of gave us a little bit of a paradigm shift. Um, I think another great thing is citizen science. So um, it, lots of people are involved in adopt a stream program. So um, even Scott, your eighth, eighth grade students are, are welcome to be a part of that. It's a it's worldwide. So I'm for sure, like in your area in the Hudson River, there's adopt a stream programs, and that just allows um, people and students to collect water and, the, and and to analyze it, and then that data goes to a, a giant database. And that's something that researchers like me get to use and. Um, and, and that's important because then we know your, your local signatures and the health of the water that you're drinking. So being, and I think, you know, just um, being outdoors and, and being active in your backyard gave, gives you appreciation. I know I grew up in, in South Detroit, born and raised like the Journey song. And um, we were lucky enough uh, somehow to have acquired like an acre of property, which we never think mm -hmm. that somebody could have an acre of property in Detroit. But um, it had like a creek running through it, and I would always play in the creek. And then, as I started taking science classes like yours, I started to realize that that's not a creek. That creek is actually contamination. It's actually like raw sewage I was playing in. And so that kind of opened my eyes to environmental science and and looking to ideas of contamination and point source contamination. And that really ignited my passion for. Um, for the earth and conservation and and looking at these systems and understanding the systems and i think more that more and more that you can understand the system the more you appreciate it and so whether that's like dealing with climate or dealing with rivers or waters or oceans um recycling plastics like uh, what we do in our human imprint on the which we live are, is so important and I'm, I'm lucky that i learned that at such a, a young age and it was because of my early science classes that 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 gave me that passion now we can this conversation goes so many ways um <laughs> because it's it's so very interesting there's so many connections here um i remember somewhere else i i read or i heard that you also live near uh, a landfill is that correct it did. there yes. is a landfill right next door to our school it <laughs> There is, yeah. there is, is there? Yeah. Yep. 
and, and that was always... really impactful as a kid because um I, again like i identify i know i'm pretty and clean right now but i identify myself as like an outdoor kid still even to this day mm -hmm. and i was um sneaking under the landfill fence i didn't know what it was i thought it was just like a mountain and so my dog and i would go under the fence and we would play on the landfill we were trespassing essentially we had no business being there but we were playing the landfill and I pretended like it was Mount Everest and I had these big expeditions with my dog. And then again, like in eighth grade, I realized like, this is, this is where the garbage that we're putting in our trash can goes. And so I made, you know, I made this connection, this full circle connection. And then I realized that I wanted to be part of the solution instead of being a part of the, of the problem. Right. And I think that's one of those like life lessons that you learn and you learned it in, in eighth grade. And yeah, I, I'm, I'm thinking for like my students, it's maybe like a, a, mm -hmm. a, a, a diamond in the rough kind of thing, you know, a silver lining where, yeah, sure, there's a landfill, but the kids are getting a, a first rate education as far as the dynamics of, you know, why is it in this, the landfill in the urban center? You know, why is it not in the my suburb? backyard? Yeah. You know, and, um, and I know I talked about it a lot more last year, this year, it's kind of, it was a little bit harder to do it, you know, but, um, it is a, a great question, you know, for these kids that are kind of getting this environmental education and not even, you know, realizing it, um, just because they have a landfill right next to their school. Um, and so, and also there's a, it's a great, uh, resource to have that river right next door as well, as far as teaching and knowing you know, where does your waste go? Um, and I'd like to ask globally, how bad is sewage in water? I know for the Hudson River, it's one of the main pollution sources now that PCBs aren't, you know, thankfully not being produced anymore, um, as well as, you know, other volatiles. Uh, but sewage is still a problem in, uh, in our area. How, bi how big of a problem is that globally? Yeah, it's completely um, terrible in some of the locations I've sampled. So one thing that I do is I, um, so when I talk about water quality assessment, just to break that down, what I'm doing is I'm in, in the field and I'm measuring for eight or nine different parameters that identify if the water is clean or not. So dissolved oxygen and temperature, nitrates and phosphates, turbidity, biological oxygen on demand, mm -hmm. um, fecal coliforms, et cetera. And so I'm, I'm able to measure those in the field, but the beauty of what I do is I put that into something that's called the water quality index. And so I do some fancy math and I take my physical data that I collect in the field and I can put it into one percentage. And that percentage ranges from zero to 100%, with zero being bad and 100% being great. And so, it's been um, a very useful tool and useful to the point that um, my research has been sponsored by National Geographic Conservation Society because because it lets me do a lot of different things. So it lets me physically understand a system and then it lets me calculate a number that I can pretty easily calculate, uh, uh, communicate to a variety of different um, people in rural communities. So what I've learned is most people throughout the world can understand a percentage, even with moderate, um, even with moderate education. And so mm -hmm. I, I go to the forest, I collect the data, and then I go to the communities and I say, what do you think your water quality is? And so I'm meeting with different stakeholders and people and youth groups, and it opens a discussion about what the water quality is. So, um, so I've done this um, on five different continents on the rivers that I mentioned. And so when I look at the water quality index in a place like India, for example, the water quality is, is terrible. Like it's, um, it could be 50%. And so 50 to 30%, which is like water that, um, that nobody should be drinking. But again, the challenge is that in India, for example, the Ganga River is revered. It's a place that people pilgrimage. It's a, mm -hmm. they want to, people go there and they want to drink the water. But the truth is that it's completely contaminated and it's contaminated with the same type of sewage that you're talking about because they just don't have the, the infrastructure to, mm -hmm. um, to, for billions of people that, that live there. So like the population has increased to such a rate 
that the infrastructure can't meet up with it. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's in that's in India, and then another place that I sampled recently was in Costa Rica, and so we would consider Costa Rica um, a developing country. Um, most tourists go to the Pacific side, and the reason is that people don't go to the Atlantic side is because there was an earthquake in 1993 and the earthquake completely um, destroyed all of the sanitation and sewer systems. And they just haven't had the money to rebuild the, um, the system. So the water, when you're drinking on the Atlantic side is gonna be a bit more contaminated than when you go to the Pacific side. So it's really um, a question of, um, of infrastructure in a lot of the places that I visited. But Scott, the, the positive is um, in some of the places in Africa that I visited, the, the, um, the mechanisms to the sanitation were really quite easy. And we've done that in quite a few places through writing like small grants. And um, there was um, particularly this one rural village, they were, um, uh, they were using these, the plastic cans are called jerry cans and they were going to fill their water at this um, stream that they dammed, but like literally like 50, 50 yards away was a freshwater stream, like spring coming out of the side of the, of the cliff. And so it was really just kind of like redirecting their attention to a freshwater source. And um, when I went back and sampled five years later and talked to the people, like the cases of malaria reduced drastically um, and over 500 people use that water as a as a source. So, um, so I hope, if nothing else, with my research and understanding these water quality systems and doing this analysis, that I can help in you know making some more positive connections for people. Awesome. Well, Vinny, if you got to go, thanks for hanging out for a bit. I'll see you tomorrow. Um, a couple other comments here. He wanted to know what was the most dangerous thing you ever encountered during your research? A great question. Oh, okay. Um, so, um, wow. There's a couple, there's a couple different scenarios that, um, that come to mind. Um, uh, uh, so one time I was, um, camping in a forest and, um, in Africa, and we're, we're talking rainforest, it's called Madpanga Forest, um, and I was alone. I, 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 I chose to stay overnight because I wanted to see, there's these little monkeys that are called uh, bush babies, and yeah. so I wanted to see them come out at night, and I was like, okay, I'll meet, meet everybody in the morning, and I had my tent up, and the next morning when I unzipped my tent, there were like green mambas like all outside my tent. Like it, it was like, <laughs> like, I don't even to this day really know what happened, but there was like several green mambas in this area where my tent was. And like green mambas are like the second most deadly poison snake. And usually you don't see any. And now I've got like all these, all of these like more than, there's at least like 10, 15 outside my tent. And so I zipped it up and I just waited because I didn't know what else to do. And so I just kind of let the dew of the of snakes. The Why does it have to like be settle. snakes? <laughs> I just let the dew kind of settle, and then I and I got the the courage to uh, open my tent and look out, and they were gone. And so I was like, I am getting my I am getting out of this forest right now. Like, <laughs> but it was I mean it was really scary because I didn't have, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know if they were under the tent, the top of my tent, and like. It was, it, so that was super scary. Um, and then um, I've been caught in storms in Lake Victoria. So Lake Victoria mm -hmm. is the second largest lake in East Africa. And, um, and it, these are rural communities. So like if you want to go to an island in, um, in Lake Victoria, you get on these wooden boats as do like the, the people like of, of the communities. And they're loaded, so they've got their flour, they've got their corn, and they've got their goats, they've got their chickens, and so they're really heavy. And we were caught in a storm, and the boat was leaking. Like I remember, like, <laughs> all right, and there's no life jackets, right? So I'm like, all right, the, if this boat sinks, and I'm not a competent swimmer, like I can swim, like I know I could probably get to land, but like, you know, yeah, how am I going to get away from this boat enough to, you know, get away from the people that are going to try to like 
you know, drag you down. The crocodiles that's the, when you get to the shore. And yeah, that's the fear is like people, you know, that's what you always hear of is like people try to grab onto you if they think you can swim. So that was, um, was a, a pretty scary moment. And then, um, um, being in like the, the Ganges river and just kind of knowing that, um, that's where they dispose of some of their dead bodies. So just kind of like that turmoil of like, and, and like the kind of like, the, just even like that smell of, of death that's, that's in that river and knowing that, you know, there's <sighs> decaying things that are, um, that are around you just kind of really worked on my mind and, and on my imagination, um, yeah, it's kind of and then um, in Costa Rica, um, and I actually had my niece with me, we did this, uh, man, it was a, a tough hike, 13 miles in a rainforest, you know, bushwhacking um, as we go through. And we saw the ocean, so we're like so excited. So like, we, we, we run into the ocean, and then we kind of look up, and then we see a shark. And we're like, what the? <laughs> and then we, <laughs> we, we got out of there real fast. Oh, so... You know, that's kind of like the, uh, I've been, it's been exciting because nothing has ever gone, um, gone too wrong. And um, I, I kind of love that about, um, about being in the field is that um, y the excitement of, of not knowing, um, it, you know, I, you always, I kind of get a bug for that. So uh, interesting in different situations. And those are just ones in the natural environment. There's many that involve. <laughs> oh, yeah. Walking around cities Involved and stuff is interesting. Interaction. Oh yeah, um, and it, I, that's why you like Iceland so much. Probably there, there's no snakes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Iceland's pretty docile. Like you can run across like a mean sheep or a mean goat that might try to charge you, but other than that, you can handle it's, that. Uh... <laughs> the, the other, the other stuff is a little bit, little bit crazy. Um, so that that was like the scariest thing. What's one of the funniest things in in your your global experiences that you just kind of think uh, back on and laugh about? One of the funniest. Um, gosh, I've had I've had a lot of fun moments. I uh, one of the the sweetest moments actually was when I was in mm -hmm. Iceland, um, and I was doing a water quality assessment on a river, and I came upon a farmer. And he had uh, a baby seal, and the baby oh. seal had been abandoned, and he was um, he was bottle feeding it, and um, they were hoping to release it. So he, I, you know, you got to pet this beautiful um, baby seal and just be up close and personal with this lovely creature, you know, that they're going to rehabilitate and get it, get back into nature. That was really just um, charming and something. I, I'll never, um, I'll never forget um, some of the um, funny things that have have happened. Is um, I have a, a field assistant. Her name is Lucia, and she's from Costa Rica. And I had this great idea at the beginning of our field season to hike this volcano. And neither one of us really knew what we were getting into. Like it didn't look like that big of a volcano. And, and and so we decided to hike it just like one <laughs> one afternoon and like we realized like this is not a, like a day trip and so um it, eventually after like 12 hours we made it to the top but it was something that was pretty unexpected it was funny after we got back down to the ground <laughs> wow Hey, Chris, and thanks uh, for and of joining course there's, us. There's, um, there's, like, and again, like when you're in the moment, it's probably not, it's probably not funny, but I remember um, also in Costa Rica, like walking down to a water source to get a sample. And then all of a sudden I saw like a crocodile, like rise above the surface. And I was like, what? <laughs> and I ran, Lucia said, I never ran so fast. And she was probably right. Cause I remember the, the crocodile was a crocodile. was huge. His eyes kind of like came above the water and I'm like, I am out of here. So I, I, I went to, uh, to Costa Rica once. I actually went with, uh, Mrs. Biter, Sai, who's in chat too, my wife. And, uh, I was always more afraid of the capuchins and the spider monkeys than I were of anything else. <laughs> Cause they can throw stuff at you and grab stuff to make yeah. those hands. To me, they're always a little bit more yeah. creepy. 
That reminds me of a time I was in um, I was in Africa and I had a I had a sandwich and a baboon came and slapped me on the back and I turned and he grabbed my sandwich. It was like, ooh, you're tricky. <laughs> Well, I have a story. I was in Germany with my family because I'm an army brat. So uh, we grew up in Germany. But I was there with my family later visiting my parents who were still living there. And they have this like this baboon sanctuary. And uh, and uh, we were there. And my, my youngest daughter, who was very young at the time, like went to get some like popcorn from my, my father, Opa. And a monkey just went and like slapped her right similar thing and she got a scratch and, and and she still remembers that's like one of her earliest memories of like getting scratched by uh by the monkey when we were there the monkey. so yep yeah, yeah she still hates monkeys. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's funny all those, all those fun adventures that you go on and i think that's one of the things i try to impress upon students is that you like to travel, you want to go out. Science is a great way to do that. Um, whether you're, you know, into field research or you know maybe you're uh, in some other, you know, capacity uh, working with science. Um, you know, being outside and traveling, it is a, a definite possibility. Um, you know, one of the funny things is one of the reasons I became a teacher was. I was kind of debating, you know, being a teacher or whatever, and I was substitute teaching. I got called in the substitute teach, but I was just going to cover for someone who was on a field trip to the Bronx Zoo. And I got finished with the day and I'm like, I just got paid to go to the zoo. I'm like, <laughs> what? This is like the best job ever. Okay. I had to deal with some kids. They're okay. But I had the other parrot. I'm like, what's up with that? I'm like, so someone's going to pay me as a job to go to the zoo. Okay. I'm game. I'm good. You know, and you know, I did some, uh, some trips with, with kids, of course, with kids as well. Um, I used to do an exchange program in the Netherlands, uh, for a number of years and, uh, and planning trips like that is, you know, a, a labor of love. Cause it's a, it's a real pain in the neck really, uh, to plan yeah, trips, sports. especially with kids that are not 18. College kids, it's a yep. little easier. And you just like, get your passport, and they get their passport. You know, kids that are younger, mm -hmm. it's a little more challenging. Uh, but it, it, is, it is difficult. Um, but it is great to see kids when they get out into the world and have experiences that they otherwise would never have. Um, do you have any, you know, stories that go with that? I mean, I loved it because I'm like, I'm getting paid to go to the Netherlands in a way. I didn't really. I just volunteered because it was over break, but it's an opportunity I had it when otherwise. So how do you feel, you know, about taking kids out, not kids, they're adults in your case, um, your, your, your students out with you on these trips? What kind of trips are you planning now and what have you done in the past? So um, at Berry College, I've been lucky enough to organize many stuff um, many study abroad trips. So I've taken students to Italy and Tanzania, um, Kenya, Uganda, so like East Africa area, and then of course to, to Iceland. And, and all three of those trip dynamics are, are so different, but the focus has always been on geology. Um, and, and I guess like the, the reason why I became a teacher is because I love geology so much and I love, I just love talking about it. Um, I just think it's so interesting and so fascinating, and and there's always so much more to learn, um, even even as a mid career scientist. So um, I really get jazzed about that, and I think that the study abroad trips have let me um, explore that in different places. So um, in, in Italy, like you wouldn't think, like what's the geology of Italy? But you've got um, major volcanoes, you've got uh, Mount Etna, you've got a brand new volcano called Stromboli, and then you know the Tuscan wine. Wait, like Str talking about Stromboli, the it's, not Stromboli. <laughs> it's not Stromboli. I'm sorry, I just made like a food joke. <laughs> talking about the the Stromboli. geomorphology and the soil science. Okay. That beautiful wine that comes from the Tuscan region. Um, the Carrara marble that made the David. Um, They've had some pretty devastating like earthquakes um, near Rome and, and Florence, um, and, and then Mount Vesuvius. So like there's just and, and really geology is everywhere you look, but Italy is one example. Um, 
in Tanzania, we studied the East African Rift Valley. Um, some of the oldest Beautiful. fossils on the planet uh, come from that region. So we got to talk about very early origins of of hominid life. Uh, Mount Kilimanjaro is the, one of the most beautiful volcanoes I've ever seen, um, and it's active. And then there's Lake Tanganyika, and that's um, the second deepest lake in the world. That's a, 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 an, um, a Rift Valley lake system. Um, and then, um, you, you, again, like the connections to water sources are, are so important in some of those rural communities. So that's been, and Lake Victoria is right there too. So exploring those different ideas in Tanzania, and then is really um, the Mecca for a geologist because you get the best of plate tectonic movement and there's 33 active volcanoes in an island that's the size of Virginia and you get glaciers and the, the beautiful landscapes to go with all that. So, um, so and, I, and really like ex, it, exploring and being an international researcher is who I even was as a kid. As I, like I mentioned, like when I was on that landfill, I was pretending I was at Mount Everest. I, I had a globe, I got a globe when I was in fourth grade. So I was about 10 years old and I would just like look at that globe and imagine all the different places in the world. And, and I'm lucky enough to have built my career around that idea that I wanted to be a world explorer and I am a world explorer. And so anytime I get to share my, my love of travel and my love of cultures and, and people with anybody is, I mean, that's just my, that's my best day ever. Yeah, cultures are interesting. As you know, you live in the South, and I never realized this growing up in Germany. Like, you go south of the Mason-Dixon as a New Yorker, it is a culture shock. I had less culture shock moving to New York from Germany than I did going from New York down south. <laughs> Yeah, you're, like, you're what is, is this here. place? Is is this still the same country? What? Yeah, no, I, I, don't I know, know there's a couple other Southerners in the in the chat too. Detroit either. <laughs> you know, yeah, because you're from Detroit, you get it. You went down there, you're like, what is going on? What? Down here? <laughs> what are you feeding me? <laughs> Do you have anything not fried? No. <laughs> no. I always yeah. say that um, in the South, uh, chicken is to the South as pizza is to the North. Yeah, I guess that's that's, that's fair. But pizza's anywhere, oh. though. Pizza's great. You can get yeah. pizza. Is, is there a country where you can't get pizza? You've been to a lot of countries. I mean, I think you can pretty much get not, some not variety of pizza everywhere. But the pizza in the South is not like pizza in the North. No, I can tell you that. No, it's not. It's, <laughs> There's a disconnect. <laughs> Well, they'll say the same thing about fried chicken in the north or For barbecue sure. as well. <laughs> so, so there's, there's definitely different things. Now, one of the best parts about traveling, I think, is the food and, and mm -hmm. trying out all the different foods. Um, what is some place you would go back to just for the food? Oh, uh, Italy. I mean, hands down, mm -hmm. like, uh yeah, I mean, the food, and, and, and you know, like, America, like our idea of like spaghetti and meatballs or lasagna is totally different than what it actually is because it's much more simple in, um, in Italy. Like the ingredients are just so much, it's just so much more simple, but it's just um, the love and the care and the quality of the ingredients goes into it. It's like, it's unmatchable. Like every everything that you have, um, yeah, and I, and I think that every different um, place I've been, like I've, I've found something that I love, like in, in Africa, you know, um, Uganda and Tanzania and Kenya, they're right at the equator. So like you get this beautiful fruit and you get these exotic fruits, like jackfruits, it kind of tastes like bubble gum. And, and so um, pineapples and, um, and different like citrus fruits, are are so good and then like in costa rica like i got to be there in december and their tamales are just like out of this world mm -hmm. so in, in yeah. iceland like the lamb well, they have this like lamb stew that they make and it's so just hearty and wonderful especially like on a cold rainy day it's like all that you ever ever could want or or need Fun. so, so volcano doc asks are, question in the chat uh, where in the world does the water have the weirdest chemistry, and why is it oh. that way? Um, 
so what's interesting is in Iceland, um, so they have a lot of geothermal springs. So mm -hmm. Iceland has a, a, a mantle plume underneath. So it's a body of hot magma, and so it generates a lot of heat. And because it generates a lot of heat, it melts um, the crust just a little bit. And so you get this really interesting, like, sulfur components in the water column. And that's not necessarily good to drink, but it's really interesting for the microbial life that lives in those systems. So it's kind of like their, their ecosystem in and of their cells. And I, and I suppose that that's probably very similar to like um, in Yellowstone National Park where you have Yellowstone geyser, you probably find a, a very similar situation. There's another place um, in Costa Rica. Um, Costa Rica is quite volcanically active. It's different though, because it's on a convergent plate boundary. Um, but there's a place that's called Celeste Rio and there's pictures of this on my website if you want to check it out. But the the water is milky blue, like it's like um, it's like a pale blue color. And the reason for that is because there's such a high um, silica content. So silica is a type of mineral, um, SiO2 is a mineralogy, and um, and it comes up again from like from heated sources like volcanoes, and it mixes with the water, and so you get this really bizarre. Um, color of the water. Again, not good for ingesting or drinking, but it pr makes a really pretty landscape. <laughs> and interesting probably for um, for microbial and bacteria life that are living in it. Oh yeah. My, uh, my wife, who only grew up, you know, maybe 25 minutes away from where we are now in, in Voorheesville, has, they had sulfur water. And mm. sulfur water is disgusting. I mean, come on. <laughs> It is gross to drink. It, it's like drinking rotten eggs. I mean, it's yeah. disgusting, at least to me. I mean, if you grow up with it, it's it's fine. She says, yum. Um, however, <laughs> if you go to the hot baths, like if you go to, you know, one of these, these fancy places like Saratoga Springs up here where they have that water, the spa water, or in the Czech Republic, you know, Carly Bivari and places like that, they have the the spa sulfur water and it's supposed to be fancy and healthy for you i just think it's gross but yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's a nice sales pitch though <laughs> oh yeah i don't think there's any definite health benefits other than the fact it's probably very clean and safe to drink because it's straight out of the ground and it's been boiled so yeah <laughs> uh, that's why it was so healthy because it didn't have cholera in it originally yeah, yeah. Parasites. You, yeah, you must have a, the stomach of iron at this point from all your travels. Um, yeah, I, I've had a gamut of different things. I had, I, I caught dengue fever um, in Africa, and I and I got bilharzia. I always took my um, my mefloquine, so I never came down with malaria. So I kind of avoided that. But and and when I was in India, like I was just perpetually sick. I think there's there's the water quality is so bad that there's probably like there's just no way to get, to get around how sick you will be the way to get around uh, is just to like eat curry by the uh cup full and that just right. kind of kills everything right. else and and then you're good exactly. right? <laughs> yeah i was pretty i was perpetually sick and, and yeah but um i got dengue fever um in africa and that's a mosquito born uh, just like um, malaria that's uh, but dengue, dengue fever you can't take a uh a vaccine or a pill for it. So um, the good news for me when I got dengue fever is I was on an island called Zanzibar. And the next day was like a free day. It was on a study abroad trip. Um, and. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Breaking up. We have lost signal. Uh, I probably get those anti-nausea um, oh. pills and I puke that up. And I'm like, I'm not going anywhere. Mm. And then by seven o'clock, I got the rash. That's kind of like the tell telltide sale of, of getting dengue fever is you get a rash, kind of like the chicken pox. And so I stayed back and I'm lucky I did. I'm lucky I got it because there were 20 students on a freaking boat out in the middle of Lake Victoria puking over the sides because their symptoms hit about two hours later <laughs> and i was on the bottom of a you know on the floor of a cement bathroom mm -hmm. wishing i had a gatorade <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
And, I was like, uh, if I could have anything in the water. world, it would be an orange Gatorade from the Walmart right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it, it passed. It passed in about three days, I suppose. Right. Well, you're kind of like me. I've been, you know, I've traveled a lot, and now and like we're the vaccines coming out for for the coronavirus and i'm like yeah stick me with it i mean i've been stuck with every other needle and vaccine i'm like yeah i yep. go, go ahead <laughs> i've had every other <laughs> shot you know your shot records are two books long you know it's uh it's an experience for sure i mean it's it's crazy those poor kids they have stories to tell too oh yeah i was on lake kids. victoria and i was throwing up <laughs> in the middle of Lake Victoria on a boat. <laughs> and there were two goats and uh, five sacks of flour. <laughs> Funny. So, I mean, we can't yeah. wait until we can finally travel again. That would be great. You can go back right. out and do your do your research. Um, we can take kids on field trips. You know, it's been, it's been tough. I know in our school, some of these kids, you know, unless they – have the school take them someplace, they're never going to leave, you know, the 10 square miles that they're, uh, they live in. Uh, so it's great yeah, for education. Was, from me as a kid in South Detroit, like I lived for those field trips. Like I just, I couldn't, I couldn't wait to, to see something just like you said, mm -hmm. without outside my 10 square mile. And then once I did get to see stuff, I just loved it. I just, kind of get enough of it mm -hmm. yep and you know that globe was your inspiration and i can see yep. you as a kid with like looking at i'm gonna go here and then i'm gonna go here and then i'm gonna go here um yeah and that also shows you never know with with kids like what gifts are going to inspire them you don't know it's kind of you know i tell people all the time like love your kids and just throw stuff at them and see what sticks whether it's yeah. a painter's brush or a microscope, whatever inspires and, and, and gives passion, um, that's what you want. Uh, so it, that is, I think, the key to helping uh, people grow um, into who they're supposed to be. And yeah. I, I know and you're, I think you're very that, much... Like, in... You just, you don't know... Um when you'll get re-inspired by those things. So as a kid, like I, I love to journal and I love to write stories. And um, when I went to like middle school and high school, I was part of the newspaper. And so I did a lot of like journalism and and I love journalism, but I, I love science more. So that's why I studied it in college. But um, I went to a community college first and I got involved with their newspaper and that newspaper becoming the editor paid for my tuition. And then when I went to University of Michigan, those two years were paid for because I was part of the newspaper, so I got scholarships. Um, and then, you know, 20 years later, I wrote a book. So, and, and it was really because I honed those skills as a kid, I'm sure of it. And I, and I had that love and passion for writing that, um, that prompted me even to, to write a book. So, you know, you, you pick it, sometimes maybe it comes again, like full circle and you, you reinvent that passion or love oh yeah uh volcano das box asks how would you suggest helping urban students expand their horizons that might be to me or you or both um it can be tricky i'll, I'll answer first just because i thought a lot about this because i teach at an urban school and I try to get kids outside as much as I can, which is tough in the Northeast. It gets very cold very early in the in the fall. Um, and, you know, it snows until late April sometimes. But I think even if they're uncomfortable being outside, getting them outside is as far is just for the experience and seeing the outside for something that they might not otherwise that te kind of trying to teach that appreciation of nature um, because you never know who's going to get inspired by it. I mean, even if I get, you know, one kid every five years, I still inspired one kid every five years. I mean, that's more than none if I hadn't taken them outside at all. Right. So I, I think part of that is kind of, like I said, getting as many opportunities as possible to, to expand their horizons and getting the, the right amount of challenge and 
uncomfortableness. You don't want them to be turned off by an experience and you don't want them to be bored either, but you want it to be appropriately challenging, uh, which is hard to do because everyone has their own interests. And you know, the minute they see a bug, they go running back inside that building. <laughs> and um, you know, it, so it, it can be tough to do, but uh, I keep trying. I mean, I, I don't think there is a magic bullet to, to try to hit that. So Tammy, what do you think? I think there's, um, I think there are different groups who are um, trying to show the environment, the different environments that urban um, communities can mm -hmm. present. So I'm thinking of like different projects where um, you can even like bird watch in a in an urban community and look for all the different types of birds that you that you see. Um, and and because you would, you know, we, we kind of have this perception like, oh, if you take down all the trees, the birds aren't going to be successful. But it, they found that it's actually a little bit opposite because as you're building buildings and infrastructure, it provides different habitats for, for birds mm -hmm. to nest. So I think like finding um, a niche that you care about and love and then seeing how that plays into your urban environment can work as well. So if you enjoy looking at birds and, you know, you can look at a bird and then go online and try to identify um, those. Or if you're interested in, in water, looking to figure out, well, what are the different things that are living in my backyard? Like, what are the different species I find in the Hudson River? Um, what are the different types of trees that live, that I find in my neighborhood? So like identifying leaves, I think is a, a good way to, to connect. Um, and even and paying attention to the sky. What are the, what are the different types of clouds that we're seeing? Um, What's the, the wind patterns that are coming through today? What's the the temperature, you know, the air temperature, the humidity? Like, do I feel those changes as I as I go outside? So I think there's different ways to connect. Um, and I'm also involved with a program that's called Skype a Scientist. Mm -hmm. And so if students go to that website, um, there's you can look up, uh, you know, different biologists, chemists, geologists, and you can send them questions directly. So if you're if you, you're watching something on TV and have a specific question about a volcano, you can email a geologist and they'll write back to you um, a response. So getting um, connected through through that and following the media, so different um, scientists or science groups is another way. And I think just, um, especially as a student, just um, seeking to learn, um, and it's certainly for me as a kid in Detroit, I always like just sought to learn. I just couldn't get enough of, of um, different science documentaries that would play on TV. So with a little bit of effort, I think you can um, learn and grow. And then with, um, with that builds excitement and enthusiasm. And then by the time you're preparing to go to college, you'll have an idea of what you want to study. And so as you're filling out your applications to go to these different colleges, you'll see your passion come through and that's where scholarships come from. Right. So for sure, don't limit yourself because you're in a rural environment. If I did that, I would have never, I wouldn't be where I was today for right. sure. And I've, I've been focusing a lot um, in probably the past five years on students be able to see themselves in a specific role. So I've always encouraged kids you know, since we started doing selfies, like, oh, you want to put on a lab coat and goggles and take a picture of yourself? Please. Oh, you want like three of you to pose together? I'm like, go ahead. Because the minute that you see yourself as in that role, that right there expands your horizons, right? You're you're placing yourself in there that, yeah, you know what? Maybe I can be a scientist, you know? Um, you know, I, I've also started uh, what I call in class uh, science scientist profiles. You're the profile uh, for the last couple of days, Tammy. So hope you know that. So you know, Vinny was here earlier. So, but uh, and so I try to get you know different scientists. Not you know, you're not Einstein or you know Niels Bohr or anybody like that. I want people that are doing current research, um, younger, um, and not just old white guys. Right, I want a broad swath of who people are uh, that are doing science, uh, so they they can see themselves and have more role models. So I want to try to do. I'm trying to do that myself too. So that way, 
if you kind of piece all this together, maybe it'll make a difference. I, th I think it will. Like, like I said earlier, yeah. <laughs> maybe As not kid, today, maybe too, 10 um, years. Stanley Ride. Stanley Ride was the mm -hmm. first female um, astronaut. And I just, I mean, I, she, I just, uh, she was, I mean, she was my role model. Like there was nobody greater than her. And so she really, um, you know, spread my, um, my desire to study science. She was a female in, in a role that, um, you know, kind of breaking a and so it kind of, even though I'm in geology and not space science, it kind of gave me the confidence to, to do that. Um, and certainly um, in, in geology and geosciences, there's still very few women, less than 10% um, of the geologists um, based on a 2019 study are, are females uh, that, um, that make it to the PhD level. So it's still um, a pretty male dominated field, but I think the tide is, is turning. And, and so even if you, you don't see somebody that's exactly like you, just know that there's somebody out there that is, that is moving forward to break those glass ceilings for sure. Mm -hmm. And I think it's especially important in something like what you're doing where you're making that connection to culture because honestly, there are things in culture I would never pick up on, but a woman would pick up on immediately. Mm. And and I, and I think that is, is so important. And that's one of the things that's been missing in science for so long and why we haven't made certain connections earlier uh, because there just wasn't a perspective for it. Yeah, yeah, I do see that. And um, in, you're in, embraced differently, probably in different cultures. Um, I can think of a time when that backfired in me. So I was um, a young PhD, um, this was like in the 90s and I was in Japan. And so Japan's very much a, a male dominated culture, at least it was in the 90s. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the meeting roles with the PhDs, like I was just naturally excluded from, like it wasn't, it wasn't even a thought that I'd be involved in those conversations. So. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm hoping now that that time has, has also turned, but I've been on the backside of that too. Hmm. Yes, that's, it is interesting. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think the world is, is changing and some cultures certainly different than others, as you can attest to. Um, you've been in so many uh, different cultures uh, globally and uh, you, you've had to have learned so much <laughs> just trying to get around um, in these places yeah. um, and trying to make your way even before there were Google Maps like I don't even know yeah. like paper maps I, what are those I remember I'm, I was traveling alone in um, in Japan and so you know you got the main island of Japan I was trying to get um, all the way down to Fukushima so you've got these uh, di these different islands I was taking the Shinkansen the Shinkansen and it goes over 200 miles an hour and I remember I remember being on the train and I had my map, but I was like, I have, I have no idea where I was like, because I couldn't read the Japanese writing and I couldn't read the, the sign on the train because it was all in character. And, and I didn't, and I didn't speak the language, um, but I took my map and and I, and I went to this older gentleman and the one word I knew was Nandeska. And I was like, where am I on the map? And so he figured out how lost I was. And he took me to the train conductor and they figured out where I was going. And then the train conductor told me when to get off the, off the train. So it was, um, it was scary and humbling, but I think if nothing else, like through all my travels, like I realized that there's more good people in the world than bad people. And like, if you're in a position there's going to be somebody to help you. At least that's been my experience. And I've had a lot of different experiences in a lot of different cultures where there's, there's good people and you, that are approachable and they're willing to like set you in the right direction or et cetera. So. Yep. I think that is a true I think that's statement. A, really, it's really happy to, to think about. Yep. That is a true statement. I've been statement. lucky enough not to have like kids things stolen to, for me, but I, I've been put in like compromised positions for sure, especially being a woman. But um, there, it seems like there's, there's usually somebody that's going to help you. Right. Unless you're alone and there's green mamas outside your tent, in which case there's <laughs> no one there to help you. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> 
you got to figure that out yourself. <laughs> One time you needed someone. <laughs> right. <laughs> Shoo them away. <laughs> Shoo them away. Mm. Well, Tammy, this was a great conversation and thank you so much for hanging out. We've been talking for an hour, over an hour now. It seems like we just started. Um, and you've been like me, you've been on meetings online forever and you probably just want to go outside for a walk, even though it's late. <laughs> <laughs> um, just to not look at a screen for a little while. So I'm going to let you go and any other last thoughts before you uh, we end this for tonight? Sure. Um, if your if your students are watching or or uh, you know any like young adults, just I encourage them to you know follow your dreams and you know everything is hard before it's easy. So like don't look at science and say oh my gosh this is so hard. Like look at it as a, a challenge because when you do something that's hard and you overcome it it is such a reward and it and it's um it builds your confidence it builds your self-esteem and and really that's like the journey of life isn't it just to like to 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 grow and change and experience different things um and even if you don't have exterior cheerleaders you can be a cheerleader for yourself and um certainly i've had to do that you know, throughout my career. Um, and even if you're receiving like negative input from other people, sometimes you just have to ignore that and say, no, I'm, this is what I want to do. This is who I am and, and just go for it. And I think that um, for me, that's in pursuing just my career and pursuing my authenticity is, um, is where my joy comes from. And so, and I wouldn't have had that without building my self accomplishments through passing eighth grade science and passing ninth grade science and passing, you know, math, one, math class one, two, three. And so just don't get discouraged. And even if you don't pass those classes, go back, redo it and, and pass it the next time. Like it's, it's just a journey. And, um, and I love science so much. I love geology so much. I just think it's interesting. I feel like um, as a scientist, I'm making a contribution. So I think through my research, I'm hoping to, um, to, to help people through changes in their water quality situations. Um, so, and that's a great reward to be able to do that. So if you're, so just go forward and, and be positive. Those are great, great final words. Thank you uh, so much for, for being here and, and sharing uh, your wonderful stories and all the information about geology and hydrology and what you do. We appreciate it. And sure. thank you, Scott. Thank you. And everyone's saying thank you and uh, good night in the chat. And thank you all for being here. If you're in the chat, I appreciate that. Have a wonderful evening. If you're in the United States, if you're on the West Coast, like Volcano Doc, you still have a little bit of time left before bed. Um, <laughs> I don't. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting close to time for bed for me because uh, I do have to wake up and teach in the morning. But it's been invigorating for me, these chats. I, I love doing them because I get kind of pumped up for teaching and education as well because you kind of, you inspire me as well to keep fighting the good fight and uh, and trying to spread the, the love of science um, with, with everyone, um, especially the mm -hmm. younger uh, generations. So... I appreciate appreciate that, and uh, just for the people on the stream, I will be trying to do a playthrough of the game Subnautica on Friday. I want to start that game, which is an underwater like adventure game um, that all my students have always said I should play just because I do science. I'm like, okay, fine, <laughs> I'll do that. <laughs> just because you say I should play it, I will, um, and it sounds fun. So um, until then, uh, good night, everybody.